Welcome aboard the USS Aeronome. To become a member of our crew, please visit perfectorganism.com slash support. As a patron of Perfect Organism, you'll receive exclusive perks and early access to content. Incoming audio transmission received. Please proceed to Subdeck 3 to begin playback. Thank you, and welcome aboard. Sweethearts, what are you waiting for? Breakfast in bed? Another glorious day in the Corps. Day in the Marine Corps is like a day on the farm. Every meal is a banquet. Every paycheck a fortune. Every formation a parade. I love the Corps! Where's Basket? <sighs> Let's rock! <laughs> Welcome to Perfect Organism, the Alien Saga podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Prater, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Patrick Green, Christian Matska, and Andy Geek Girl. And today we are here kind of to step out of our our usual episodes that we've been doing about Covenant and about like just kind of a bunch of other things about Geeger to talk about the New York City Con and Andy and Christian both attended. And it was pretty wild based off what we could see in terms of photos and who they met. And so we're here to kind of talk about that. I was there as a guest, but Andy, what did Andy do? Um, I may have worked. <laughs> at the, uh, I volunteered with the cast and crew of Aliens. I want to use a deck of cards. Um, gotta say, pretty excited about that. So, yeah. So it's nice. It, uh, I'm interested to hear from your perspective. Because as you know, I didn't see much other than the view from the table behind the table. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you also saw roaming around. Yeah, it was a very well attended convention. My first since the pandemic. So, you know, there could have been a million people or could have been a hundred people. It was a lot of people in, in my mind, but um, lots of great vendors, lots of other guests uh, that were there besides obviously the five actors from Aliens who were uh, Jeanette Goldstein, Mark Ralston, William Hope, Michael Bean, and Rico Ross. I hate this job. Yeah, so my morning started... Um, so just to give some background, I have volunteered at a bunch of other Comic-Cons over the, I would say, last four or five years, um, probably starting in 2016, and mostly Walking Dead, which I used to be obsessed with, Kind of definitely got out of the loop with that um, and just started rewatching as I was telling Jamie. But I made a lot of connections there within the con, you know, realm. Um, and so after the pandemic, I mean, we're still I know we're still in it. But, you know, as things are opening up and this opportunity presented itself, I I mean, I had to I had to uh, take the leap and so despite some reservations about timing and, you know, wanting to make sure it's safe, uh, I, I just kind of went all in. I'm like, when am I going to get this chance? So I, I did um, using some friends that I've made along the way, not using, but, you know, going through the utilizing, the, <laughs> utilizing. Yes. <laughs> um, and just you know, partnering up with a couple of other fans and, and friends that we've done this with, um, you know, we I had the opportunity. And then I didn't really know I was working with them until that morning. I had suspicions. We kind of dropped hints here and there. Um, I think my friend definitely knows I'm into aliens. But because of my experience, too, I think he had the confidence in us to to you know, he was confident that we knew what we were doing. Um, and then we just kind of got the ball rolling from there. And my friends and I kind of were just all assigned with them, you know, like, oh, you're, you guys are going to get the aliens crew. And so when we went to the tables, we got there early before anyone was there. We saw all their names in a row. And we were just like, ah, this is going to be amazing. Uh, and it was. So the day, I mean, that Saturday morning when we got our assignments, it was just 
from there on out, I think I was in a dream world. Um, but no, it was lovely. We uh, the first encounter was Jeanette and Mark in the green room. Um, unfortunately, they didn't have tea, and Mark really wanted tea, so I felt like oh, you know I tried to get that for him. But once we got to the tables and they were there, I mean, it was literally nonstop. The lines weren't huge, but it was always a steady stream of fans coming up. And so, you know, uh, we did get to talk a lot. I actually worked side by side with Jeanette, who was amazing, so sweet, personable. I had an amazing time. Um, And she was right in the middle. So as I looked to my left, and I would see Rico and Michael Bean at the end. And then I looked to my right and I saw uh, William and Mark. All right, I want combat seating. You know your places. I was just like, pinch me every two seconds. Um, but yeah, so I'll definitely have stories to tell. I do have to say the highlight, Christian, one of the highlights was definitely meeting you in person. So that was, I was really looking forward to that, I have to say. Well, that's so awesome. And I felt the same way. Um, So my 45th birthday was Friday, March 11th, the day before this whole thing. So when I first saw, I can't remember, some group put up a picture, you know, this is coming up in WinterCon. This is who's going to be there. And I had a lot of reservations about being in a a place like that and how I was going to get there. And just slowly I worked out the correct method. I live up in Maine. And so I had to fly in on Saturday morning and I flew out Sunday evening, um, but it was so worth it. You know, I, I got some N95 masks and just did the thing the right way. And what Andy was saying about the lines, there was always somebody that wanted to talk to the actors, but it was never, uh, it was never too bad. Like the Michael Bean line, uh, I think was probably a half an hour to get from the start to the finish. And he was amazing, by the way. Uh, I was waiting. It was about 11.59 and I'm looking at, at the clock and thinking he's going to take his lunch break and there's a hundred people behind me. But, and I, and I was willing to be like, okay, you know, cut it off in front of me if that's what you have to do. Cause I'd rather he ate and was happy or whatever, but no, he likes to work the whole way through until I don't know, four in the afternoon and then call it quits a little bit early. So he was so excited to meet people. And a guy in front of me brought a replica of his pistol from tombstone and he jumped up and he was twirling it around and doing all the tricks. And, and finally, he got it to do what he wanted, which is apparently you flip it. And when it comes up, it's already cocked. And he was so excited to have done that. So I just was, I don't know, I was blown away by how generous all of the actors were with their time. But I was also blown away by what people brought that they wanted to have signed and a little bit jealous because, like I said, I flew, so I couldn't really bring things. People had carts full of replicas and all kinds of stuff, but I don't know. It was, it was really quite something. And Christian, you were nervous and I told you he's going to be lovely. And he was, and I'm so glad you had a wonderful experience. Um, I saw, so I was sitting there and taking pictures of you as (laughs) you were getting ready, as you were like paying in anticipation. Um, I took some video of Christian talking to him Cause I, at that moment, Jeanette was, Jeanette's line was not super busy. And so I got to see from the bird's eye view too, uh, a lot of those interactions. And I did catch that gun twirling moment, which was a thrill because he, what he like his face lit up. Um, So that was, that was thrill. And he loved your cosplay, by the way, he did. So that was a whole other ridiculous part of this was I thought, well, if I'm going to go, I want to, I want to dress up. And as listeners might know, I'm really into the costumes. That's, that's my thing. And so the first idea was absolutely, I'm doing the whole thing. I'm bringing the metal armor, the helmet, everything down. And then over the months it got whittled down like, okay, I can't fly with this. I can't bring that. It's not going to fit my luggage. Then there was a whole period where it was going to be the smart gunner rig just without the smart gun because Mark Ralston and Jeanette were going to be there and that didn't work. And it just kept getting smaller and smaller. And honestly, the, the whole situation that's going on in Ukraine right now actually did influence my feelings on the whole thing. I decided I really didn't feel like dressing up like a Marine. Um, So instead I went with the Nostromo uniform from the first film, 
my friend Adam Ezekiel, my friend Adam Ezekiel does a fantastic reproduction. And so he actually lent me um, his prototype trousers to wear to kind of do a test fit. But then I had no idea if the actors would have any idea who I was. And the neat thing was that Michael Bean was honest about that. He's like, hey, I don't know what you're dressed as, but you look really cool. And so when I told him, he got really excited because he also really likes the first film. And he made some joke about Dallas. and It went over my head and it was awkward. But all in all, oh, and everyone thought that I was supposed to be Ash, which is kind of cool. But being the nerd that I'm like, well, you know, see this pin right here and this, the color of the wings shows that you're actually the captain of the ship. <laughs> um, but we got some great photos and yeah, I had some, some really neat interactions with a couple of the, uh, with the other actors, which we can get to in a minute, but I don't want to, I don't want to talk too long. So what else are we going to say? Before we move on, uh, can you go ahead and plug your, your friend's website? Because I I went there to look at buying crew pieces. So, so Adam Ezekiel runs Nostromo crew.com. Right. He's also really active on, um, the prop replica forum um, if anybody follows Adam Savage, Adam wears Adam Savage wears Adam Ezekiel's Nostromo uniform in a lot of his videos now. When he's getting down on the ground and getting dirty and, and fixing things, he's still wearing the Nostromo uniform, which is really cool. So yeah, NostromoCrew.com, just a fantastic eye for detail. My wife actually helped him with the design of the buttons. Looks like love at first sight to me. Because the Nostromo uniform buttons have a very specific pattern that weirdly is also echoed in the back of the engines of the actual model of the ship. I don't know why that exists, but it does. Uh, so because, because she helped him, he gave me a shirt. So that's, that's how that works. That's, yeah, that's definitely awesome. Go there. And you, you can buy all sorts of stuff from that site and he will custom make you a crew jacket as well. If you commission one through his website. So definitely check him out. Yeah. I've been talking to him. Well, it was, it's been a while, but I spoke to him about a crew jacket and he's just the nicest man. Uh, so my question is about what are the conversations that happen with fans? I mean, in terms of like a general sense of what they're talking about. I know, Andy, you were right there, but then Christian, you were in the line watching, listening. What do people talk about with these, with their icons, with their idols? So um, I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so because I was working with alongside Jeanette pretty much for the two full days, I did hear some of others. I didn't really hear much of Mark's interactions because he was down farther. Um, but, you know, I mean, hands down, the the first thing, like the word that kept popping up over and over and over again with Jeanette was badass. You know, everyone, female, male, kids, they love her character. And, you know, and it was just a range of ages to some I, I, along the lines of what we spoke to her uh, about, you know, as far as I joined the Marines because of you or because of that character. There were a couple of those um, just a lot of, you know, women like it showed that women could be strong and powerful. There were a lot of lines quoted to her, which, you know, of course, and she was. Every time she always smiled and like laughed and like either set a line back or talked about it. Um, you know, everyone want, loves the interaction with Hudson and have you ever been mistaken for a man? No. Have you? But they also love her relationship with Drake. Um, the fact that she was sitting next to William Hope and, they, you know, sometimes they would comment like, oh, you guys are sitting next to each other. <laughs> and then they would, you know, she would say like, but you know, but we respected each other in the end. It all like it ended well between us. Um, but she was always, a, you know, like really just genuinely happy to hear about what a positive uh, impact that character had. A couple of people had, um, you know, a lot of shirts um with, you know, either El, Rize El Riesco or like just her face on it. That's as badass. Um, and I loved seeing everybody's stuff. Some people brought in like the action figures um, and she got a kick out of seeing all of that. So she was really gracious. They love, I mean, there's, you know, I mean, they love Vasquez. And then there were, a, a, there was one who came strictly for near dark like a, a near dark fan. And she loved that because it was a switch, 
you know? So she told a couple stories of filming and how, if you guys remember the scene where they're coming like up over the hill and it's just like them in silhouette. Um, she was saying that was like a lot, like Catherine Bigelow woke them up like at the last possible moment. It's like, get up. We've got the light. You're we're filming this shot. Um, and she said that was kind of tough, but that she loved it. And it was all night shoots, you know, um, but she, her face lit up when she was talking about that. And when they would ask about Bill, you know, some people asked about Bill Paxton and she, you know, said everything that we know about him, that he was so gracious and down to earth and a, a joy to be with. And I loved hearing all of those stories, you know, partly because I didn't ask, like, it's stuff that I also wanted to ask, but I like it was good that I didn't since I was working with her. So I was glad when people did ask those so that I could hear it vicariously. Um, but it was great. I, lo- I loved hearing every second and I would listen to every conversation. <laughs> I would listen every time. I'd be like, I want to hear the stories too. Some were Titanic, some were T2. Um, you know, obviously mostly aliens, but, uh, but it was great. I loved hearing all those stories. I did see one guy brought his own sort of gigantic Titanic. I can't remember if it was a poster or a print or something, but he definitely, that, that was what he was there to have signed by Jeanette Goldstein <laughs> was Titanic. Um, I ended up talking for quite a while with William Hope about Thomas the Tank Engine. You don't have to be sorry. It wasn't your fault. Because he did voices on that for about 10 years, according to him. And he really liked it. No, no. Oh, he's Canadian. But uh, yeah, yeah, um, he did all kinds of voices. And my oldest son, when he was young, was one of these train obsessives. And so we did a lot of Thomas the Tank Engine. And one day I just, it just clicked. Like, wait a minute. I know that voice. So, of course, William, uh, uh, Michael Bean, people were bringing Terminator stuff and uh, you know, just all kinds of movies. So he had action figures and things that he was signing for that. All of them had photos, you know, on the table that you could choose from. And, of course, Mark Ralston has been in an absolute ton of great stuff. And Rico has been in all kinds of interesting things from Doctor Who to Babylon 5 to the Whitney Houston video. Um, so people were talking about those sorts of things. My favorite conversation though, that I overheard what, cause because the lines weren't too bad. I was just, I was a, a gadfly. I just kind of hung around and whenever per- someone wasn't talking, I'd step back. You did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I was hanging a little further back at one point and just the number of women that would walk up to the line, look at Rico Ross and say, damn, because he's a very <laughs> handsome guy, you know? And so I told him that at one point and, and uh, he got a kick out of that. I heard that. I mean, was it? he's like sixty. He doesn't. I mean, he's ageless. He doesn't. He looks no. fantastic. He looks. He better. looked fantastic. I have to say, they all looked fantastic. Yeah. And there was a group shot that they took of just the five of them when they do like the photo ops. And Jeanette brought it back to her table, and they all looked so happy and amazing. And she's like. Oh my God, this one's great. She's like, this one's a keeper. And they all said it like William came over and he was like, yeah, he's like, I love this one. Um, it was so nice. Like they literally were so happy to see each other. I got, I was there with them when they all kind of started trickling in and the hugs they were giving each other. They all had like little mini conversations with each other. Uh, it was really nice to see. They were, you know, it's like they picked right up right after it. And yes, Rico was definitely popular with the ladies. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It was kind of nice being right next to him. He was like, my friend, uh, Anne Marie was in between us. She worked with him and she immediately was taken with him. I mean, they hit it off too. They were talking the whole time when he didn't have fans over. He was delightful. Interesting little side thing. When he was t- telling her stories, sometimes like, you know, he would talk to both of us and kind of fill us in. And he was talking about the Whitney Houston video. And then I swear this happened. It's the strangest thing. So the uh, driving home, I think it was Sunday or like Monday, the next day when I was already home, I never listened to the radio in the car. I always either listen to podcasts or iTunes. And for some reason it wasn't, my Bluetooth wasn't working. So I turned on the radio 
And the second I turned it on, it was that Whitney Houston song, I'm Saving All My Love, which I probably not have not heard in like 15 years. I, I love Whitney. I listened to that song. And I'm like, what? So there was some <laughs> weird thing in the air because he was talking about that song. So it was crazy. That's just my little side weird note. But um, no, you have he a lot loves- of those in your life. Yeah, I do. <laughs> it was it was weird. But day one, the first day he was in this like blue suit. This the, the color of this blue was like so I don't know. I don't, how would you describe it, Christian? If you even remember, I was sitting here next to him the whole time. So I know it was just like this really cool blue. Um, and he looked like, I mean, he stood out. Hot as hell in here. Definitely. But they all they all looked great. They all looked so happy. But did Mark Ralston ever get his tea? So the second day, <laughs> um, because I was working with like their manager, there was a, let's just say there was a lot of like counting. I was responsible for the the cash, right? So there was a great responsibility. So none of us could really like leave. If we did, we had to make sure that we were always watching that. Um, so as soon as we got there in that morning, I I told the management the manager, you know, like I'll be happy to go grab him tea because there's a Starbucks and the thing. Um, but he walked he walked in with his own tea. And I went up to him and I'm like, I'm so sorry about the tea yesterday. And he was like, he's like, please don't worry. You know, he was so nice. Um, And then that led into like this great conversation about the Ninja air fryer and, (laughs) and yeah, we like, he was just like going on and on about this thing, but it was, it was just down to earth conversations you know, I made sure I didn't Chris Farley my way through the whole thing with like the, do you remember that scene when you were, you remember that time when you were in Aliens? That was awesome. I did not do that. I was so proud of myself. Um, I, you just start chatting with them like they're the normal humans that they are because they are. And they, it was just, it took us into these wonderful little conversations We chatted about their families and what they were doing in New York after, you know, what their plans were afterward. And, um, you know, we, I talked a lot about Jeanette's business and especially like like during the pandemic and all the struggles she went through much more detail than we did. And it was like fascinating, all the stuff that she had to kind of maneuver, you know, to, to get through that time. Um, she asked me about my family. I talked about teaching her brother is a teacher. So we talked about that, uh, just really lovely personal conversations. And, you know, it was, it was just like, nor like we were just sitting there and in between, we would just have these wonderful little chats. Um, I will treasure those two days forever because, you know, it was, it was delightful. We did talk some shop. We talked about some movies, you know, like we talked about some behind the scenes stuff. If it came up when uh, fans would come to the table and then let's say, you know, no one was after them. I would ask maybe a question to, you know, about it, like that would go beyond what was said. And she was completely happy to to expound upon that. Uh, We talked about aliens, talked about Terminator some stuff I knew, but, you know, some stuff she would, she did say aliens was probably the most, the toughest shoot, like, like just rigor wise, because it was a lot of like physicality and, you know, carrying weapons. And even though she was fit as hell, she's like, it was just, it was the most physical, but no, she, she had wonderful stories to share. What what other conversations did you have, Christian? I'm wondering. Well, like with Mark or like Rico, because I know I I heard a little bit of Rico, but. So I potentially veered too far into the Chris Farley territory. But I I thought, (laughs) okay, this is this is my one chance. I'm going to go for it. And again, costuming is is my thing. So I I had two experiences. I'll, I'll start with William Hope because I walked up to him and I said, hey. This is after we talked about Thomas the Tank Engine, you know, for a while. And I said, so 
I noticed that Gorman has a wedding band and, and he cuts me right off. He says, nope, nope, never worn a wedding band. There's, no, there's none. Ah, okay. So I went away and I, I did a little Google search and I came back with my phone and said, all right, so I'm half right and half wrong. You don't have a wedding band. It's not on your ring finger, but you do have a gold band on your pinky. And he lit up like he hadn't thought about this in years. But when he was 18 years old, his father had given him a solid gold ring that had the, the Hope family crest on it, which is an earth that's breaking apart. And in Latin, it says, at space non fracta, which means hope is not lost. And then he lost the ring after they filmed the movie. And so this just, it, it, like, it brought a whole flood of memories back for him. First of all, that he'd, he'd shown it to, um, to James Cameron and said, do you think this looks enough like what a Marine would wear? And so they use it in the movie. But then, like I said, he'd lost it. And I think he just had forgotten that it had been there. So that was kind of fun. And I think it's because of that, that the following morning, when we were going through the line at Starbucks or whatever, William Hope walked by, by me and said, hey, Christian, and kept walking. I'm like, hey, William Hope. Because <laughs> that was great. So then I did the same thing to Rico Ross. I went up to him and I said, we'd, we'd been talking for a little bit. And I have to say, when Andy mentioned that she was a teacher, he just lit up. He was so pleased to hear that and told her that all teachers go to heaven. So he get did. that in writing, Andy. That's, <laughs> I did. that's your pass. Um, but I said to him, all right, everyone talks about what he has scratched into his armor. He has hev in a heart and all of that. But on the shoulder plate, on a piece of white tape, he had written, uh, when in doubt, nuke him. And he said, no, I didn't. Okay. Well, in the photos in front of you, there, there it is. And oh, that one you can see a little better, like right here in the photos. And he totally admitted, okay, hold on. I forgot that I did that because he says that he's, he's very much a pacifist now. And it's been 35 years, but 35 years ago, Rico Ross decided that his character would have one in doubt, Newcomb written on the shoulder plate. And so we talked about why he would have done that. And, you know, he kind of had a laugh about having forgotten but then the next day they had a big Q and a of, of the actors. And he was trying to remember Emma Thompson's name because he'd worked with her in a movie. Uh, Jeanette had, had challenged them all to mention the worst role they'd ever done. And so he wanted to talk about this film, but he couldn't think of her name. And so he asked the audience, you know, who was, who used to be married to Kenneth Branagh. And so I yelled out Emma Thompson and he stopped and he looked at me and he pointed and see, said, see that guy, that guy's got all the answers and then told the story of how he had forgotten that he'd written this on, on his armor, but that I'd reminded him. So I think that gets me out of the Chris Farley zone just yep. slightly, but it's pretty good. Uh, no, then, you got out. You got out of the <laughs> zone. You got the blessing. <laughs> the funny thing, though, with the, with the Emma Thompson role was that because things were very tense on the set, because she was going through this very public divorce from Kenneth Branagh, I'm not sure if that influenced his decision or not, but he decided to try to do a um, Jack Nicholson. He was kind of channeling a Jack Nicholson vibe. And now whenever he watches the movie, all he can hear is himself trying to be Jack Nicholson. And so that's why what he's movie? Like, I don't know. I've got to look it up. They were so quick though, to bring up fantastic, awful films that they'd all been in. Like William Hope had been in this Steven Seagal direct to DVD kind of thing where for whatever reason, there was a, there was a, portion of Southeast Asia that if Steven Seagal was in it, boom, they had already sold the movie. They had they'd made their money before they shot anything. And it really went to Steven Seagal's head so that he wouldn't follow the script and he'd take away lines from people and all this crazy stuff. And they used a very specific expression for taking a movie you know isn't going to be good because the money's good. It's got a dirty word in it, so I won't say it. What the hell are we supposed to use, man? Harsh language? Anyway. Was it but, <laughs> Tin Fish? Was that? It was more Sorry, like tuck, I was lo- tuck Tin Foo. Fish. It looks like. Oh, the name of the film? <laughs> yeah, the name of the film, Tin Fish, 1990. I thought you were that- trying to use a code word. No, for no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out Tuck Foo over here. I don't know. <laughs> Fuck you, money. Fuck you, money. If the, if the money is good enough, like, all right, fine. I'll do this terrible movie because the money's good enough. So, Tin Fish, that's the, the Emma Thompson Tin film? Tin Fish, yes. Never okay. heard of it. And Jeanette Goldstein said she did a movie where she played a Cuban assassin and it was, um, it was a supermodel. It was her one and only leading acting role. And it just, 
Um, but I can't think of who it was. In this, in this Q&A, though, they all were saying, every movie you work on, everyone's like, oh, let's stay in touch. Oh, you know, give me a call. And that, that never happens. That this is the film. The Aliens is the one where the cast has absolutely stayed in touch and stayed very much like a family. Uh, Mark Ralston, Ralston was saying how he wasn't really going to come to L.A., for the premiere, but that Bill Paxton just kept bugging him. Like, you got to come, you got to come to the point where Bill put him up in his apartment and, and Bill stayed with his girlfriend instead. And that it was because he got to the, the premiere that he really kind of got his, his toe in in Hollywood. And, and again, they all shared stories about how wonderful it was to work with, uh, with Bill Paxton. It seems like he was a connective tissue for a lot of them. You know, like the fact that he consistently comes up so much as one of people's favorite parts of any project that they've worked in. I'm sure who's a big reason why they bonded so much and kept that bond through the years. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And they've all done so many other projects with him, you know, like he's kind of been the common thread, you know, he's worked like what, four or five times with Michael and then like Jeanette and Lance, they've all formed this little Cameron family that kind of, and you know, Mark too, Jeanette's worked with Mark on multiple things. Um, I love how that's, but Bill seems to be that common thread amongst a lot of that. Um, and that's why I think they stay such in touch too. They've just, they formed this little eighties sort of nuclear family that everything kind of bridges off of that. Um, but you could tell, I mean, it wasn't that fake, like, Oh, Hey, like they were genuinely happy to, to see each other. Um, I have a question though, Andy, for you and Jeanette, what was the moment where you're like, Hey, we had you on our show. Was there that moment of like recognition? Uh, it was actually after Christian came because there wasn't really a moment before. And then like the ball got rolling. Uh, there was a moment where I was going to say something. And then like, literally we sat down and people started coming because they let the VIPs in before. And so there were people like already waiting. And so once Christian came up to the table and I was like, Hey, and we hugged and we, and we were, and then we kind of, in that moment, we were like, Hey, we, you know, we're on the podcast together. And we sort of talked about it from then. Um, yeah. So, and then that's like, that was the jumping off point. And then it came up a couple of times after. So I wasn't going to, but then the second day I figured, wait, my, my family's like, we, we live like an hour from the con and I'm like, my family's home. We're not, they have no plans today. Like I, I texted my husband. I'm like, why don't you guys just come for like a few, you know, a few hours. I hadn't even thought of it. Um, and cause I've taken my girl, you know, I've, my girls have been to New York comic con, but, um, and a couple of others and they love it because they love the Star Wars and the, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. And like, they love all the little booths. So, and the, and the cosplay. So they came. Um, so they got to then talk to her a little bit about it too. And, you know, it came up like, oh, they were on the podcast. So I do have to say at first, she didn't, like, I had to remind her a little because she probably has done you know, it was like for us, it was like a life changing moment for her. She's like, what up? <laughs> so, but she was, um, she, and then she's like, oh yeah, yeah. So it was nice. Um, but yeah, it was that, that's where it came up. That's and awesome. then I think you came to the table a couple of times, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I just kept, couldn't get rid yeah. of me. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't, he was like linger. Cause it really wasn't like any other uh, previous cons I've been to or worked at, it's like the line is never ending, right? Because, you know, and it's, everyone's there, like like the Walker Stalker cons I used to work, you'd have these giant lines for people like Jeffrey Dean Morgan and, you know, the, the main stars, but even the little ones, you'd get this steady stream. I mean, those cons had way more people, but it was nice having a steady stream, but also having those moments, you know? So Christian would like come up and we chat a little bit, and then people would come up and he'd step aside or go to somebody else or walk around. So it was nice. We had a lot of, you know, those moments, but I truly my, didn't. Yeah, go ahead. Just gonna, my fear was that it was going to be like what you were talking about, where great, 
I wait in line. I see one of them. I start over. I wait in line. I see one of them. I start over. And then what am I going to do? I'm here for two days. So there was never a point where anyone, where they were all just without someone to talk to, but I just kind of worked the line and figure out where to fit in. More than once though, I noticed um, if they were going to different things, like they had to take photos with people or, or go to different um, uh, Q and a sessions or whatever, where you'd see some of the actors uh, like, like Michael Bean and Mark Ralston would, would stop and just have a really nice conversation. And I would be like behind a pillar watching them. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> this is amazing. You know, these two people that I've admired for so, so long, like each other and they're talking, which actually leads to the weirdest fun one for me. I was walking around the corner of where the aliens actors were and Denise Crosby, who played Tasha Yar in Star Trek Next Generation, was just around the corner. And there was a police officer standing there. And I and I kind of stopped beside him. And I looked. And Jeanette Goldstein and Denise Crosby were deep in a very happy conversation together. And I looked at him and he looked at me. And there just was this like, uh-huh. Because Vasquez and Tasha Yar are, are like touch points in my brain of mm-hmm. powerful, awesome, beautiful women from 1987 or so. It was just funny. And so I actually mentioned it to Jeanette later and she, she laughed, but the, they've been friends for a long time. Cause just when you work in Hollywood, I guess, um, if the lines had been ridiculous, I don't know. I would have seen each of them once said my piece and then it wouldn't have been anywhere near as much fun for me, but I truly believe there was enough movement through that building that they had breathing room, but they still got to see lots and lots of people I also noticed the actors were taking photos of fans who were dressed up in fun ways. So a lot of, um, a lot of people dressed up as Vasquez came up and Jeanette would take their photo or take their photo. They have a photo taken with them, but just some random stuff too. Like there was this really tiny little girl dressed up in a, it was a a skin tight suit with a, with a crazy wig and one eye was covered and the actors came right around from the table to take photos of her because she was super creepy and weird and, so yeah, they all loved her. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know when, what you sent us, when you sent us that picture, my skin crawled. I was like, yeah. wow, what am I looking at right now? Yeah. They did. They they were all taking like they all noticed her and they were all like, oh. And they would, and I think one of I forgot who, I think Jeanette or Rico maybe posted on their Instagram her. Mm. And it was funny seeing it from you know, like them posting, like, oh yeah, I remember that person. There was the smart gunner. Mm-hmm. Um that you know like the uh, the working smart gun with the you know the steady cam contraption and everything she posted that i think mark did too um so they did they really enjoyed seeing the the different you know all even just the shirts sometimes like a shirt would uh there was one moment where it was the shirt with all the marines you know in the scene in aliens when their names all come up on the screen um and being the nerd that I am, I pointed it out to the guy wearing it. Like, you know, who's missing from that one. Right. And also from the movie. And he's like, what? He was like upset. And I'm like, Hudson is not on that. Hudson's not on that roll call. And he looked at his shirt and then Rico, same thing. Rico was like, wait, what? And had no idea. And I was like, it might've been, he just wasn't on or like names were still scrolling. So his might've been at the end, but no. And I think, he was ups- like the guy was upset. And I'm like, it's not a mistake. Cause at first he thought like the company that he ordered from made a mistake. And I'm like, it's not a mistake. It's from the movie. <laughs> so well, Andy, you were pointing out to Rico, some of the, um, some of the goofs in aliens that are now, they, they fixed them in the Blu-ray, right? Like the, the model maker whose, whose eyes are poking yes. up over, over the colony set when the, the APC is driving by. And Rico's just like, what are you talking about? I've never seen that. <laughs> and we're telling him how you can't see it in the Blu-ray because they got rid of it. But if you go back to the DVDs or, or the VHS copy, you can hardly see it because the quality isn't as good, but it's still there. Or we were saying like Lance Henriksen, you can see his lower torso through the floor where he's supposed to be ripped in half. Yeah, he didn't so know were, that. No, and they were super excited about yeah. that stuff. Yeah. It was, it was fun. Yeah. Rico, it's Rico. Because they we know more detail than they, you know, like... From the visual watching, I mean, obviously they know more about the filming process, but they don't watch it as much as we do. So we know all the little details that are like, what? So that was, that was fun. The one piece that I brought from 
from the costume, from the, the smart gunner rig. And that guy, I talked to him, he did an amazing job. He was very uncomfortable, but he had the whole deal is, um, you know, the scene in the movie where they have to, they have to collect all the magazines, right? So for the smart gun, there's this weird little plastic piece that gets unplugged with a, a couple of stereo mic plugs and they pass it in. And of course, Vasquez has spares and gives one to Mark Ralston. And so I had, Va- had Jeanette and Mark each sign it with something that they had said or had written on their uniforms or whatever. Uh, and they were pretty excited about that. But when I went to talk to Michael Bean, um, it just sort of slipped out of my bag and he recognized it. He's like, I know what that is. And so, you know, he, he took a look and he saw how they'd signed it and he thought that was pretty cool. So even I, I think that's a pretty deep cut. I think that's a pretty nerdy thing. And so that Michael Bean recognized it, knew that it was from the movie that he'd done. That was awesome. Yeah. So speaking of awesome Michael Bean moments, um, so day one, I didn't really work, you know, like he was busy, like I said. So his line was like a steady stream and he didn't really take breaks. He just works through and then left. Um, but I did get to kind of talk to him at the end um, and mentioned my girls, mentioned the picture. And I, when I tell you, I mean, his face, he was like, oh, he's like that picture. He's like, you know, every now and then when I look up my own name, like he was like kind of being coy about that. He's like, you know, sometimes I Google myself and he's like, that picture always comes up. And he's like, you know, and he loved the fact, I didn't tell him I did it, but he loved the fact that somebody had placed the two pictures side by side, the one from the film and the one with the girls. And he's like, when that, when I saw those two pictures side by side, he's like, that was the movie. So I told him that was what I was thinking the whole time while it was happening. Cause I've seen that movie so many times. Like I was watching the scene, you know, like, you know, but like, just the seriousness. So he commented, he's like, I love how serious she was. And I was like, oh, she was listening to you because he was legitimately telling her like, when you point, you know, when you're like, like shooting, like you, like, this is how you look. And he, and I told him that everybody who caught, con- like not everybody, but there were a ton of comments, you know, when it kind of went mini viral, a lot of people commented on the, his, teaching her proper um, trigger discipline and how you can see her finger, not on the trigger, but on the side. And he's like, yeah, that's so important. And, and like, he's all about like proper gun control. So the next day um, when my, when my family came over and we, they got to talk to him, they actually had those pictures with him signed. He signed them, wrote a little message to them. Um, He actually did. We talked about, you know, the unfortunate accident that happened on the movie set recently and how, you know, he's like, I, basically he's like every movie that I've ever been in, I've fired a gun, right? Like cops, Navy SEALs. He's like pretty much everything. Um, and he was talking about, he's like, I, that is the one thing that he makes sure he's like, I don't blame, you know, he was quick to like not place blame on anybody, but he was talking about how when he is handed a gun, he makes sure like he fire, like, I guess he like fires it into the ground or at least like make sure there's no like random thing. Like he was talking about, like he was really intense about that. Um, So that was cool. But then another surreal moment, I, I wound up bringing my tracker that Xander made for our little Christmas gifts. Um, and the second day his son was also there and he was like, you know, going around to the con. So when my daughters were talking to him and his son was there, he was like so excited to see them because he saw the tracker. So at one point, how surreal is this? They were walking around together, right? My daughter was holding a lightsaber that his son had. He was holding the tracker and he went up and he told her at one point, he's like, you be my dad and I'll be the lady with the big gun. (laughs) And then they would go around and he would go up to people with the tracker and be like, nope, you're not an alien. Nope, you're not an alien. So, you know, my daughter was on a bug hunt with Michael Bean's son. It's pretty cool. 
It was surreal. I have to say, I didn't get to see most of it because I was working the table, but my husband, my husband told me all the stories. That is amazing. Um, you know, I, I want to say if I had been speaking with Michael Bean and Navy SEALs had come up, I would have asked him what the hell was going on with all of his driving sequences in that movie, <laughs> because I don't know if you've ever watched it, yes. but he's in this old Jeep CJ and he's driving it like the, on, the, on the highway. And as a kid, I was like, what the hell's going on with this car? But, you know, it would have been fun to ask that. This is this has been absolutely incredible. Um, I, I want to do a Patreon shout out before we wrap. But before we get to that point. Are there any further anecdotes either of you would like to share with our listeners? I know you get you met a certain Dave Gogol at this, which, uh, you know, as somebody who has been Gogol fied in person myself is a fun time because he's a great guy. And uh, and I'm, I know if you listen to his podcast, uh, the Hive Mind, uh, a Xenomorphing podcast, you can hear his thoughts on this, too. I think he's going to do an episode on this pretty soon, maybe with some of you on it as well. Um, but that was that was pretty cool. Did you get to meet anybody else you guys, you know, know from fandom or from, you know, friends outside of? this stuff while you were there or was it pretty much all just random fans? Mostly I, I made some new friends. Um, the, the alien costume that I, I posted a photo mm-hmm. of on our, on our page. That looked really good. The guy's Instagram handle is at Ripley loves Zeno and super nice couple. She, she does Ripley. He does the bug and they're just great. Um, but Michael Hickey, who is a, a moderator on the William Tony bulletin, um, I've been friends with him for years. So it's kind of, that was neat. He looked exactly like his avatar, but it was a, his avatar is a cartoon wearing a, of, of himself with a, uh, Batman baseball cap. And so this guy with a Batman baseball cap walks up to me and like, I know you. So beyond that though, it was just meeting a lot of, uh, a lot of new people who thought I was Ash. Yeah. And I was just happy to, like I said, I didn't get a, you know, I was kind of contained in that area, which, you know, I'm not complaining at all. Um, by any stretch. Um, but I just, it was nice for me to catch up with people that I haven't seen in person and, you know, uh, in over two years. And I looked at the date and it was the, the, I think Sunday, right. Was mm-hmm. the exact two anniversary of basically when everything shut down, at least in the U S. Um, and so it was a nice marker of like where we were two years ago. And then this sort of, you know, me kind of feeling like finally it's okay to sort of put myself out there a little bit. So, and in what better way could I have done that? I can't think of another one. So it was nice to just see friends again and meet my podcast bud in person. <laughs> um, you know, and we got to uh, hang out that uh, Saturday night for a little bit, which was nice and catch up and wait a really long time for a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> <We did>. um, <laughs> but it was worth it. I'm kind of glad because it just extended the the uh the conversation a little bit more. So mm. no, I loved it. It was a it was a fantastic time. My my final thought is I, I had to leave a couple hours before the convention ended to get back to the airport. And so I'd I'd said goodbye to people. I'd mentioned to Rico Ross that we have a podcast just before I left. Uh-huh. And I watched the elevator and I pressed the button because we were up on the sixth floor of this place and I was the only one in the elevator and then a whole bunch of people piled in and right at the end, Michael Bean and his wife stepped up to the elevator and looked at the number of people and said, okay, now we'll, we'll wait for the next one. Like, oh man, I want to jump out and ride the elevator down with Michael Bean. <laughs> but you know what happens when you ride an elevator with Michael I know, Bean? it's not good. No, no <sighs> bad things Zeta happen. comes in. Ah. No. That's true. And then he drives out of the parking lot. <laughs> the wheel going all over. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. I've so, and a last thing I always want to ask him. I don't know if has anyone ever asked him, you know, cause he didn't get to decorate his armor. Has anyone ever asked him like what he would have put on it? Cause that's one thing that I would like to ask him. And it never happens because I get like, swept up in this like oh my god i'm talking to michael bean and then like other stuff happens and then i never remember so maybe next time i'm sure there will be a next time um but yeah so i always go back you know i go home and i'm like what all the things i could have said and didn't say but you know it played out exactly as i would want and i would say if anyone does get the chance you know if this is your thing and you love love this movie and you love cons and you just want to meet cool people, you know, not even the actors, but of course the actors are amazing. It's just a fun day to be with people who get you, right? Like you find your tribe at these places. Um, 
And that's the thing that I would say. But if you do get a chance to meet these actors, I mean, they truly, when I say, and I'm not just saying this, they truly are down to earth, lovely people who enjoy this. Sometimes you can tell when actors are like, "Mm," and they don't want to be there. And these, at least on this, these, this weekend, I think they were just so happy to see each other and the fans and just be out and about. Um, And it was just, it was lovely. It was lovely to see. That is wonderful. Yeah. So get out there. Don't do what I did, which is say you're going to go and then go, I can't go to a birthday (laughs) party. Because what one thing that came about as a result of this con happening is we found out that most of us have birthdays within like a few days of each other (laughs) because Christian's birthday is the day after mine. And that was why I couldn't go. I, I think this, you sold me on it that next year. If this happens again and, you know, we get some colonial Marines in the house and I'm going to be there to join both of you Um, before we wrap, I wanted to say a a quick thank you to we have a number of new patrons who have joined the last couple of weeks. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, read those names out. So uh, I think I've already given a shout out to a couple of these, but can't hurt to do it again. So since February started, we have Brendan Vandenay, John Martino, Lee D., Ben Rush. We have our good longtime friend Mark Deckard rejoining. We have Greg Bromley. And we have Marcus. I always like when people do only their first name because I think of them as, you know, mononyms like Madonna or something. So Marcus, thank you. You don't need a last name. You're fine. We got you. Um, Just a little bit of a Patreon shout out. Jamie and I just recorded another sublime noise on Jaws yesterday that will be coming out before you're hearing this episode. So if you want to hear our thoughts on the Jaws film score, which is, of course, one of the most iconic and well-constructed film scores in history, you can join our Patreon by going to perfectorganism.com slash support or just searching for us on Patreon for just a few bucks a month. You get access to all of that content and we would love to share it with you. I'll turn it over to Jamie to bring us home. Yep. Thanks for listening, everyone. And uh, we will be back. Alien Day is coming up soon, so we have a lot in store. Um, thanks, Christian and Andy, for talking about your experience. It looked wonderful. I was very jealous. It's great to see you guys next to like these people that we talk about so much and that are so a part of our lives in their own way. So thank you. We'll definitely have to all go next time. and That'd be awesome. Yeah. Meet up. Yeah. Yep. For more on Perfect Organism, the Alien Saga podcast, please visit perfectorganism.com. Perfect Organism is available for listen or download through Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and Spotify. If you'd like to support the show, please visit perfectorganism.com forward slash support. Thank you.